Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics Podcast. I'm your host, Ahmed Hassan. Today, uh, something a little bit different, something special, I think. We thought we would round up some of the advices that our great guests have given us. And that's what we're going to do. And, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. We've published a really great article for people that are interested in becoming intelligence analysts. It's mainly for the US perspective, but I think from other intelligence fields and countries, they, they would have some, some great insights too. We're gonna try to do one from different countries and experiences, so yeah, look out for those. Thank you, and let us know what you think, guys, and we really appreciate all the feedback that we get. First up, we have Jason L., uh, ex-Marine, previous nuclear security professional, and before that, he was a CIA officer. And today he works as a, as a recruiter for the intelligence community in the U.S. And he gives some great advice. So I would say two things. The first thing would be if you are a person who's of strong moral character, strong integrity, you know, that sort of thing, keep that no matter what, at all costs, keep that. Because that is going to be, I would say, that would be, in my experience, the thing that washed out probably... 75% of the people who I know of who washed out, it was usually an integrity issue or a character issue. If that's the kind of person you are, maintain that at all costs, you know? And the other thing would be, be curious about the world that you live in. Don't bury your head in the sand because that's another thing that a recruiter, an uh, IC recruiter is going to look for is they're going to want to know, do you know what's going on in the world around you right now? The agency, when I applied, they asked, you know, Hey, you know, can you tell us something that's going on right now? In one of my interviews, you know, what's, what's a big thing in the news. And it didn't matter. I could have said something about sports. I, they just mm -hmm. want to know that you're keeping up with the world around you. They don't care about your political affiliations one way or the other, as long as those political affiliations, your political beliefs, your morals, things like that, don't skew how you do your job. As long as it's, you know, that sort of thing. You might not like whoever the, the president is at the time or whoever's in, you know, Congress or the budget like that. You might not like him, but who cares? That's not, that is not, should not affect your job. So they're going to want to see those things. They're going to see that, uh, they want to see that you can be um, morally, not morally ambiguous, but you can have your morals. You can have your strong morals and you should, you know, have those things. But as long as those things don't cloud your judgment and the way you do your job. And then as far as like your criminal background is concerned, if you don't have one, don't start one. If you do have one, <laughs> put it in your past and work to keep it there. Because again, there are many things on the list of what the, at least the agency considers that they will be able to work with. What they are, I can't say. I don't know exactly and probably wouldn't say because yeah. I don't want somebody saying, oh, okay, now I can go rob a bank and I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as long as it's not a repeated pattern and a history, because again, that speaks to your character, you should be able to, be, you should be okay. And if you're associating, even if you're not, you don't partake in those things. If you hang out with people who do, they're going to find out. And that would be enough to, for them to say, no, thanks. Because again, that speaks to your character, you know? So I would say long story short, keep up with the world that you live in and be, be able to speak about what's going on, you know, give your opinion because that's a part of intelligence reporting is you report the point in that process, especially as an analyst, you're going to be asked to give your opinion on why you think such and such happened or this world leader said what they said. So be prepared to give your opinion as well as the facts and just keep your nose clean. And if this is what you want, then push for it. You know, yeah, the, let the agency or let the IC tell you thanks, but no thanks. Don't let anybody else dictate that for you. Ah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go work for, you know, for the government. Our government's corrupt or such and such is in office right now. You don't want to go work for them right now because it's not about it's in office. It's about the agency that you work for and the job that you're doing. That's, that's it. Fair enough. And is there anything that you could say, I mean, I think the two, these two are very important as you stress them. Is there anything that you could like train yourself, maybe read or that, that you came across and say, Hey, that, 
that's a skill set or, or, or that's something that, that is practical that you could practice for like, like languages, for example. Okay. So I'll start with that first. So languages, you do not run out and buy Rosetta Stone and think that that's going to get you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a bonus if you do. And if for, for certain jobs the you know, they may require that you pick up a language, which they will train, they will give you that training once you're on board, if you can't get it before you on board. So, but if you're interested in the language and you're, you know, far enough out, you're young enough that you can pick up that language before you apply, do it. I would encourage you to do it. When I was in college, I didn't speak any languages until I got to college. Then I studied some Egyptian Arabic and then living in Japan, I picked up some of it horribly in both cases, <laughs> but I still picked up some, but you can actually monetarily, you can, you can be awarded bonuses for speaking and writing and reading at a certain level. You'll yeah. test. And if you, depending on how high you score and maintain it, you could get a lot of money for, for, for that sort of thing. But the other thing I would say is one of my regrets coming on board to the agency was not reading more about the agency's history and their mission. So if you have an IC agency that you are interested in, read about them. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just read all about them as much as you can so you have a better understanding of what it is you're walking into, whose shoes you're about to fill, so to speak. I would say that if you're interested in a certain area of, let's just say, political science or, you know, world affairs, whether that's China or Africa or counterproliferation or something like that, Read up on those things, study on those things. Just know that that may not be where you end up because mm. just like in the military, there's that saying the good, the needs of the service, you could on board with it in your head that you're going, Hey, I'm going to, you know, the China desk. That's where I'm going to sit East Asia division. I'm going to sit in the China desk. This is what I've been studying all my life. And they're going to be like, you speak German, right? Yeah, I do. Well, guess where you're going, you know? So you just don't know. <laughs> You know, they're yeah. going to try to use the skills that you have if they're, you know, through the interviews, they're going to find out that, hey, I studied a lot on China. I'm very interested in that. And they're going to try to steer you that way. But if at the time the need is for X and you studied Y, well, you might go to X first, work there for a little bit and then bounce back over to Y. You just have to be fluid. Cool. Oh, and also, sorry, last thing would be your uh, writing skills. Writing mm. skills are important. If you're not a very strong writer, work on it. And one yeah. of the things that a recruiter, I've always been a strong writer, which I think that's because of my parents. They were very big on that. But a recruiter, one of the uh, tips that they gave me for someone who's not is every day or every couple days or a couple times a week or whatever, watch something on the news, look up something on the internet or read a newspaper, and then take whatever that is and write, write it out. Like, Hey, this is what I looked at today. This is what I saw on the news today. Write out the facts, first of all, because that's the most important quote unquote part of an intelligence report, the facts, then underneath that or on a separate page, write your opinion on it. You know, Oh, you know, I think that this world leader said this because of this, or these events happened because of this, in my opinion, because that's just as important as the facts. So yeah, so definitely your writing skills. It's a whole nother world. These are not college papers you're writing. So the format that you're writing these reports in is, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen, but I was good at it. So helped. Yeah, that's an excellent piece of advice. I mean, uh, I see this all the time with young people coming out of school. It doesn't matter. Top schools around the world. And the first thing they hit their head on is writing because they can write beautiful essays, but when it comes to writing reports, straightforward, mm -hmm. you know, don't mess yep. about, don't waffle around. Yeah. That's where everybody yeah. struggles. And I mean, everybody it doesn't yeah. matter how smart you are. Mm -hmm. If you've never done it before, yeah, that's a huge one. And, and yep. I think also for us, something we pride ourselves on to focus Absolutely. on God when we have new people or interns and with the training, same way to to get that to a point that you're confident and, and people giving you an assignment can be confident in your writing. Yeah, that's it. And it's gotta be uniform. It's gotta be, everybody has to write the same way because 
the person that's going to end up reading this stuff and possibly using it to formulate policy or, you know, whatever, there can't be any room for variation. It's got to be the same because especially if it's going in the PDB, the president's daily briefing, they just peruse through that thing. So, and most of them don't read it themselves. I believe, I believe they're, you know, it's a, uh, a briefer who does it for them, but it's got to be succinct to the point. And these are the facts, you know, so that's how you need to learn Absolutely. how to write. So uh, yesterday you and my, you and I talked about this, that you have a couple of years left. What are the, what are the plans after you leave the government? Yeah, I'm about five years from retirement. Once I'm done doing that, my wife and I's plan on a personal note is to buy the biggest RV because she's not a camper at all. So and she's giving me a dirty look right now because, uh, she, you know, she wants one where she can do everything in it. You know, she could shower, whatever, you know, the only time she needs to, wants to go outside is to, I guess, look at the weather or something and then travel, just travel around. And then also because I'm retired from the Marine Corps, we can fly what's called space a space available. So we can go to just about any military base, uh, air base. And if they have flights going out and they have room on it pay a small fee, hop on board, fly to wherever that plane is going. So that, and then professionally, because I'll be retired, it's, I guess it technically wouldn't be professional, but I'd like to teach at some point somewhere, some, you know, with a company like yours or something, I'd like to be an instructor, just pass on the things that were passed on to me. Awesome. I mean, yeah. Raise my grandchildren. I mean, you, you know? look very young, so I don't think people would assume you have children, but yeah, two of them. Beautiful babies. Amazing. I, I, I always ask this, not only in, in, in podcasts, but I ask this to everybody that I, that I speak to. What are you reading right now? What am I reading? So right now I am reading Call Sign Chaos. It's, the, it's a book about uh, General James Mattis. I'm sure mm -hmm. most everybody is familiar with him. And it's really a book, uh, a book about him and his career. It's just as much, if not more, a book on leadership and how to work on, acquire those skills, you know, that sort of thing. I really just started it. So it's, mm -hmm. um, I'm just getting into it, but it's pretty good. You know, however you feel about him, he was, uh, from what I understand was a pretty good, uh, I never served under, but he was a pretty good, uh, leader. So someone gave it to me as a gift and I, I think said, most you know, I'm going to give Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean. Give, you know, love it or, or love them or hate them. I, I'm the kind of person where whatever it is, book, whatever, I'll try to take the good out of it. You know, I'll try to, you know, even yeah. if, you know, I don't like the person, if they're spewing some sort of knowledge, even if it's something I don't agree with, I can take it and say, okay, mm -hmm. that goes on my list of things that I definitely don't want to do. You know, if it's an experience they had, it's something I don't want to do, and I can still use that in my life. Um, so far, so good. Great. And I mean, maybe you're not, but what are you watching? Is there anything you can recommend that you're watching right now? What am I watching? So my wife and I had started watching the terminal list. It's uh, based on oh, a yes. Jack Carr novel simultaneously without her, which she hates. I'm watching a series, uh, <laughs> called the old man. Yeah. See, I just got another dirty look. He just gave this look of betrayal. <laughs> I started watching that and it's a, it's a, with Jeff Bridges. He plays a, uh, long retired CIA officer who cut his teeth in, uh, Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. And basically it's his past is coming back to haunt him and people want him dead. And so he's got to, uh, stay on the run and it's really, really good here in the U S it's on, uh, FX. Yeah. It's really good. I'm going to check that out. I, I think I interrupted you. You wanted to add something. Oh, no, I was saying I was, it was a half joke because it's actually true. Plus any uh, Marvel or DC movie that comes out, I'm hopping right on that. So I'm a geek like that. You're in good company here. I'm looking forward to Black Adam. The yes. Rocks, uh, That's going to be good. DC version yeah. of Black Adam. I want to see how they, because he's always known as a quote unquote bad guy in the, mo in the comic books. Yeah. I guess for those who really don't know him very much, but he's like an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to see how they exactly. portrayed him. And honestly, I don't think they could have gotten anyone better to play him than The Rock. Maybe you could have played him. I'm sure. <laughs> Stop it. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> nowhere near that shape. So I wish, I don't think I would be able to maintain that in this lifetime or even the next, but thank <laughs> you though. Jason, thank you so much 
for your time. Is there anything you would like to add that we haven't touched upon or that you want to get off your chest, maybe? Um, no, not really. I mean, for, for better or worse, actually worse, we, uh, are living in, I, I think I've said this phrase probably four or five times in the last couple of weeks. Um, since nine 11, we have witnessed been witness to or participated in historic and sometimes horrifying events that people before right. and maybe after us will never have never seen or n- will never see and what it's done to at least this country um and from what i can see of the world too it just it enrages me and it saddens me and but i don't think it has to be this way so i think that if we can if we narrow it down to let's just say the ic to someone who's really interested in joining the ic i think that if you look at it from a point of view of how can i come on board this agency to make a change i think that will go miles and when i say make a change i don't necessarily mean socially those things will probably come from above us as they as they have whether they're forced or it's like hey it's time that we you know you know, come into the modern age and do these things, those things will take care of themselves. Those things will happen. And rightly so in most cases, rightly so. But I think if, as far as the person, the perspective, I see employee, you know, someone who really wants to do this, if they can come on board with, you know, oh my God, I live in a time where anything is possible, good and bad. What am I going to do to influence those things for the good, you know, to make those changes? I think that'll go a long way. And if you keep that in your head every day, like every day that I was at the agency, again, I told you, I'm kind of like a geek like that. The one thing that got me out of bed in the morning was, you know, I'm not going to curse, but holy crap, I get to go into this office or go to this meeting with this asset and talk about things or see things that the average person will never, ever even know took place or is taking place around them. And so I'm going to do it the best of my ability. And I worked with people and was mentored by people who are in books and, and, you know, portrayed in movies. And I, and I won't talk about who they are, but some of the most amazing men and women I have ever had the pleasure of working with and for, and those things, because they helped change the world when they came up and they pass it on to me. So I feel like it's my job to pass it on to someone else. So if one of your listeners is really interested in this and they reach out to you, you're more than welcome to give them my email address and I will um, answer whatever questions I can. Our next set of advice comes from Jack Margolin, the former program director at the Center for Advanced Defense Studies. Since we last spoke, Jack said Palantir. But Jack gave also some, some great perspectives on, on research and how to approach analysis and, and publicly available information. So I've thought about this a lot through like interns that we've had and coaching them and working with them and newer analysts and what I've learned and what's been valuable for me over the last five years. And there's a lot of sort of general thoughts I could share, but to condense these to the ones that I think are the most useful, I would start with evaluating why you're interested in this field and what you want to do with it. And I think that having that mission, having that sort of clarity of purpose is really helpful because there's so many different ways that you could approach analysis, intelligence, whatever. And that will depend on the sort of relationships that you want to build and have and change you want to affect. A big part of that, honestly, is to just, and I would say this is important for the fidelity of of people's work when they're breaking into this field and generally for their health and well-being. As someone much wiser than me once said, most things happen without you. Don't Mm -hmm. feel like you have to engage with every problem. And I think that Twitter is such a valuable resource for people breaking into this field, not necessarily for them to... For them to raise their profile, yes, but more importantly, to start building connections with people that know certain problem sets or have higher context in certain areas to help you fill in the gaps in your knowledge. But it's also, I think it can be really poisonous because it kind of creates this race where so much of what we see in sort of OSINT Twitter, people talking about politics or international security is this sort of race to be the first person to include some kind of satellite imagery or thing that they found on Telegram. And like, God knows I've been guilty of that in the past too. But if you're not engaging with a problem that you know really well, yeah. it's so likely that you will get something wrong. You will unintentionally share disinformation. 
And ultimately, being part of that scramble, I think, is is really tough and not particularly rewarding and isn't necessarily going to help you build skills. Um, not going to help you build skills to really be useful because that's what we all want to do, right? We want to be useful. What I would recommend people do instead is to really think about what their interests are. And those could be thematic. It could Maybe you're really interested in forced labor. It could be regional. You know, I've done a lot of work on, let's say, specifically Latin American security or Latin American illicit mining. I'm really interested mm-hmm. in that environmental degradation. It could be technology-based or sort of like looking at a specific data feed. I am, this is clearly my bias, I'm super interested in aircraft and the aviation. Mm-hmm. Based on that, I would recommend that people starting to break into this field and establish themselves, start to develop the skills that they can use to demonstrate a unique value add. You are going to have a really hard time developing transferable, sustainable skills at just looking at everything all the time. Yeah, It's much better to say, this is really what I am going to focus on for the next three, six, nine months. And I'm going to learn what there is to know. And I'm going to start to develop not just knowledge, but skills that let me look at this in a way that other people can't. And then I'm going to use that to start engaging with other problem sets and with other people in the field. That's really what's been most rewarding to me. Like I, people talk to me a lot about Wagner because that's most of the public stuff that I talk about. Mm -hmm. Uh, My team does so much other stuff that is in many ways, I think much cooler and more impactful than my work on Wagner. But I talk about that because it is something that I know and I've looked at for a long time. And I can use that to engage with people who have more knowledge of the countries that they're active in or other sort of phenomenon that overlaps with that. People that know Ukraine better than I do. I uh, Sure, I lived in Ukraine for nine months, but I, I don't speak fluent Ukrainian. I don't know the, the sort of ins and outs of this conflict in as much detail as many analysts do. But I can say, hey, you know, I really know a lot about the, the networks behind Russian private military companies. I want to talk about what I understand there. And I want to hear, based on your understanding of the conflict, what that means. Mm-hmm. And through that, you can share that knowledge and, you know, you can have concrete data and analysis to share that otherwise those people wouldn't have. So focus on developing something that is unique, knowledge and skill, where you can start to deliver value to people. They'll deliver value back to you. I think that that is key. First of all, if you're trying to do this publicly, if you're trying to do it in the private sector to being able to demonstrate that you understand how to approach analysis and investigations. And I think it'll be key if you're looking to do this in the government space, because it will give you the experience, obviously, in the specific area that you're focused on. But through that, you're going to learn a lot about how you best learn methodologies, what you're most invested in. And I think ultimately about research and project design and about mm. analytic standards. And that is going to really be the bedrock, the foundation that you can build a career off of is, is high fidelity work, people's trust in your analysis and a reputation, either whether it's within your specific small professional community or more broadly through your public work. Julie Nell is next with some harsh truths about the mindset required for this line of work. She has worked in various UK police intelligence roles and is now managing director of B4 Secure. Understand the type of personality you are. You have got to be incredibly tenacious, self-motivated, and have a real problem-solving mind. If you're not those three things, you're not going to you're not going to survive, or you're not going to be decent at, in the intelligence field. And the reason being is because you are constantly hunting for something, and then the problem-solving bit is making those links and being able to answer the so what's of what those links. So it's no good just, you know, trawling mm-hmm. through, cutting and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. There you go. That's everything we found on Joe Smith. Well, that's, well what does it tell me then? Mm-hmm. Well, well, why have you found all that? Well, was there anything in particular mm-hmm. that sort of stood out? You know, so to me, you know, somebody that calls himself a, an Intel researcher or an Intel analyst, if that's all they're doing, that's that's not that's not my world. That's just you know anybody anybody can do that. To be mm-hmm. a really good analyst, OSINT researcher or intelligence officer, you have got to have such a curious, inquiring mind. Yeah, you'll jump to the wrong conclusions, but that's why analytical techniques are so important to stop you. You know. You, playing you know play your devil's advocate mm-hmm. do your red teaming do you know your back casting make sure you're using 
you know, anything in the book you can to make sure that you're not coming to the conclusion you want to. But you've got to have a tenacious inquiry mm-hmm. mind. You've got to be um, willing, I think, as well, to constantly train and constantly learn. Look at the new techniques, especially in the OSINT world. Look at what's yeah. changing. Look at what's new in the field. Don't rely on software. I have tried so many different, oh, we've got we've got this amazing piece of software. It will do all this trawling. You'll be able to find this person that will tell you everything. No, it doesn't. And it, if you just want a very basic overview, then, then fine. If you're wanting to really dig deep, you have to do it. You do it manually using various bits to help you build your bespoke search uh-huh. for, for that that individual or that group or that ge- you know geographical location or that asset you cannot think you can put something into this one sh- you know one one size fits no one piece of software and it's going to drag up everything in fact what it can do is give you false you know false things back saying there's nothing out there oh right there's nothing out there and it's mm-hmm. for me it is that it's that manual hard graft that finds those absolute nuggets and it's frustrating. The other thing is, I don't think, you know, you get these different personality types. If you're a, what I call a complete finisher, you make a brilliant investigator, shall we say, because you see it all the way to the end, to the trial, through that. And as an intelligence officer, nine out of ten times, you'll be compiling it all, putting it into report, and releasing it to the, into the wild or to your client. And you've got no idea what they end up doing with it where they go with it, do they then proceed with it? And you, you've not got to really care because you're then on to the next project. Do you see what I mean? And sometimes it will sit in somebody's drawer. If you're going to get upset about that, again, wrong job. <laughs> so it's, again, you've got to, I think, look at who you are as an, in, as an individual. Now for some views from the great Garrett Westwood. Garrett at the time was a director for global security and intelligence for a big pharmaceutical company. Since then, he transitioned into a role at Sibyline and he has a very rich background in the British intelligence community. There's lots and lots of things I could say, depending what you want to go into. And you know, learning a language is always great. Having been technologically very savvy is awesome. There's, you know, some great I say cyber and inverted commas qualifications out there like the CompTIA Security Plus that is just good to have because these days, even if you're not in a cyber role, you know, having an appreciation of, of IT and, and the cyber landscape is is prudent. But hey, some people, you know, that's, that's not an essential. I'd say be very interested in the world around you. That's, that's going from the kind of precise to really quite vague. And take a deep in- interest in international affairs. I mean, the corporate, right, so corporate intelligence or or kind of public sector, the security landscape, job landscape is wide. And, you you know, it goes from investigations, due diligence, all the way to kind of global risk. And it's, uh, it, and, and it's hard to make a decision what you want to go for, unless you know. And, and actually, for a young professional, you want to be able to put your net, re, your net really wide. So you want to, one wants to be able to do, you know, a, a CV, a resume, one minute for corporate intelligence, and, and the next minute for a global risk, you know, embed position or global security operations center position. So what are the things that unite them? Get on an OSINT course, right? Because actually, whether you're doing global risk or whether you're doing kind of investigations, a, a good appreciation of how to do open source intelligence gathering, the tools out there is really great. Okay, so get on. There's lots of free stuff out there. Some of the stuff is more geared towards cyber and some of it is geared more towards global risk. I've already said about understand the world around you. Get on the podcasts. I mean, you know, long as I, I, I can't, I, I've got the time to read however many different newspapers each day now. But I would definitely get on the podcast scene. Look at look at all the all the, most of the suppliers and resources that I mentioned earlier have a some kind of podcast going on. You know, so 
whilst Great Dynamics should be your first podcast that you listen to every week when it's out, of course, definitely Thank look you for at, that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely look at all the all the podcasts that I mentioned earlier, all the companies that I mentioned earlier that have a variety of free podcasts and you can just catch up with the world around you. Also, you know, in the UK you have I think the Telegraph and the Times and Guardian and a few others have daily kind of two minute updates as well. Get akin to what's going on around you. I mean a lot of these positions in the private sector require a degree. You know, many require a master's uh, degree as well. I would say if you're in education, look look to do an internship, look to do some work experience somewhere. Because as you know, I, I say to many folks when we're on career advice calls, it's about demonstrating what you can do, not just saying what you can do, but demonstrating the effect of what of your skills. And actually, you can you can do that in academia, but you know, it's better if you can do that in a work environment be an internship if i w- I'd recommend going to the public sector you got you know you can go straight to the private sector from academia and many of the suppliers that i mentioned earlier they they're analysts you know straight from you know king's college or ucl or, or whatever university however as an exponent of it myself i would advocate public sector experience you know look at look at the law enforcement right look at the police you don't have to be a police officer but uh, there's in the UK, I know, especially and in the US, there are, are plenty of police civilian analyst jobs. They tend to be more targeted, more, more tactical and operational. But, you know, again, look at the military. In the UK, we have the Army Intelligence Corps. You can join as a reserve or a regular. The RAF have an intelligence branch too, and I believe the Navy do as well, all of which I believe you can join as a reservist or a regular. I'll give a shout out to, you know, got a lot of friends in three military intelligence battalion in london that's out there it's, it's got a website i, I know that to be a, a really good battalion if, if you live down that way but there's across the country there's lots of reserve and regular units you can serve with and if you can you know if you can serve with a regular unit for a few years you'll end up doing a variety of, of really interesting roles many of which will prepare you for again an equally large variety of private sector roles if and when you want to come out and that's from Everything from investigations to cyber to global risk and, and, and running, running a team. And, you know, if you think you want to join the military, but you've got maybe a, a stereotypical cliched view of it and you've got to be super, super fit and you run around with a gun all the time. It's not always the case. Obviously, you need a level of fitness and all the rest of it. But the military is probably not what you think of it, especially if you're going to, you know, police, security, intelligence signals, that kind of thing. It's not what you think. So I'd look at that. I'd also look at, yeah, you know, government. It's not just the three and four letter agencies that have an intelligence capability. You know, in the UK, civil service jobs, which is a website for, for government civil service workers. If you type in keyword intelligence, everyone from, you know, the Charities Commission to Revenue and Customs to Information Commissioner's Office, all these weird and wonderful government agencies that have intelligence capability because intelligence isn't kind of a, a really secret word anymore okay there are obviously agencies out there that do things that are very discreet but intelligence these days you shouldn't just see it as kind of top secret james bond stuff it's not you know and, and most agencies have a need to know stuff uh, not just to know information but have that information analyzed by a professional and then curated in a way which makes it relevant and actionable for that agency and that's essentially what intelligence is whether that's business intelligence for a council or a company or, you know, it's a government agency. So look at government as well. And the final thing I'd say is don't be put off by location. And this is very quickly becoming into a recruitment call, but recruitment podcast, but don't, don't be put off by location because whilst there are obviously agencies in which you need to be in the office, either because it's their company policy or because of kind of operational security reasons, met many Many companies and many organizations, even the public sector now offer remote, you know, or semi-remote hybrid working. So look at all of those and apply to all of them. Because if you just apply, you know, if you apply to the military, it doesn't come off. You've wasted a year and you've not, you know, so apply for all of them at the same time. Get a police application in, look at the private sector, apply for the military if you want to, look at the government work. Nobody's going to, you know, you're not going to be black marked for applying. It's a bit of work but just apply to everything. And as I said, in the, in the meantime, make sure you have an interest in the world that you're living in. Get technologically aware, I'd say, even if it doesn't push your buttons, get aware of the of what's going on in IT and in cyber. And again, there's many podcasts out there. The CyberWise is a really good one for lay people. And 
and and yeah, make sure you keep up with 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 world events and and what's going on, and not just not just broadcast media, but long form discussions by experts in the field as to what is going on. And finally, we spoke to our colleague, friend, Marcel Plistia, who is a former DIA analyst about analysis, about how to apply skills and how to apply them most importantly in our daily lives, in our jobs. I mean, my mind, my mind goes to like social media immediately, right? Cause that's where there's a lot of like streams of information mm -hmm. and things like that. I think people will talk about like low information people and, 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 and sites like Twitter, right? Amplifying different messages and different takes and things like that. I think the benefit to sort of giving everyday people some of the, you know, I don't want tools, tools makes it sound like a, like it's a, like a program or something, but sort of the, the techniques, mm -hmm. right. About thinking, critical thinking about issues and they, and they don't have to get this from just intelligence people, right? This is something that academia in its own way tries to do and, and journalism in its own way tries to do, but thinking about information in like a structured way, and I don't necessarily mean like a structured analytic technique, but like if you see a piece of news, we can use one of the articles I wrote on, on Iran, Iranian drones going to potentially going to Russia as an example, right? Mm -hmm. If you see that, if you see that piece of news, right, Iran is sending hundreds of drones to Russia. You know, you have your, you have your knee jerk reaction, right? But if you're trained or if you're just naturally a good critical thinker, which um, I'm very jealous of, you know, you start to kind of break that down. You're like, okay, if this is true, what indications would I look for? You know, if this is, if this is true, what, what other pieces, does anything else contradict this? How credible is this source on this issue? Because someone can be an awesome source. Like I'm an awesome source of, well, not awesome, but I'm a good enough source on like Wagner in yes, Africa, right? But if you start asking me about yeah. China, Taiwan, whether or not I'm right, it's more a matter of luck, I guess. Yeah. So, so it's sort of approaching, approaching, especially controversial or political topics in, in a structured way and not necessarily that's kind of knee jerk, automatic, emotional kind of way. I think you get, you, you become a more informed citizen for a start because you start questioning and investigating things and, and you become a little bit more resistant to disinformation or misinformation or even stuff that's where the author didn't intend to be wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. But now if you're a reporter, you have a duty to report if Sergey Lavrov says something as a, as a journalist, yeah. you know, you, you can challenge that, but you also have to kind of say what he said. Right. So, so yeah, I think, I think that's, I mean, there are other ways, but I think that's, uh, that's like a really fundamental way because a lot of people will blame the structure of Twitter or Facebook. And that's, you know, that's fair. Those aren't, those aren't perfectly done, but mm -hmm. you can also approach those platforms. If you approach those platforms with like stronger critical thinking, a stronger sense of um, how to process information, how to prioritize information. I think you can, as an average person, you can get a lot more out of those platforms. Absolutely. Well said. I mean, I think you're hundred percent right on that. I, I, I wonder really about critical thinking and if it's, and how trainable it is, mm -hmm. you know? You can share best practice. I mean, if you if you don't want to learn it, right? Because it's easy. It's easy to not be a critical thinker. It's so mm -hmm. easy. Like even 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 people who I know who are superstar analysts, right? If if you get an issue mm -hmm. where they're emotionally attached to it, or or there's other stuff, right? That that all that all the training goes out the window, right? But I think it's I think it's worth I think it's worth at least at least really making making an effort to develop some of those tools, some of those critical thinking stuff. And I mean, you, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's even if it only comes in useful, you know, 10% of the time, you're at least engaging with, with more things thoughtfully. Absolutely. So I think, I think it's, I think it's worthy. I mean, you can't like, nobody's perfect. I'm not the perfect critical thinker, but it's about making that effort. I think. You are hundred percent right because I'm, I'm guilty of that too. You know, there are issues mm -hmm. where I, where I have knee jerk reactions, hence why I don't really write about them mm -hmm. because I think maybe I'm too close to the fire. Not that I cannot write about them. I'm just trying to, to be better. And I'm not one of those people that says you need to, you have to have this profession or you need to be from there to have a good take on that, on it. Right. It's, uh, yeah. that's, I don't believe that either. On the other hand, I don't believe it either. What a lot of NGO people say where, well, locals cannot do it because they're too close to the problem. Right. As mm. if they were children. No, I'm that's, that's like the NGO. Right. I'm not saying that every yeah. NGO researcher says this, but I've heard it more yeah. than, but it's, it's more common. More than it's more common than you think. Right. Yeah. 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 And, but I think also there's a perfect segue into 
while we are developing an intelligence uh, training program, at least a foundational one, and, and I think a bit more advanced of later on. But I think for every researcher, for every, it doesn't matter if you're in like you know, finance or economics, or I think mm. general intelligence tradecraft like structured analytic techniques could be mm. beneficial for everybody to learn if you're a student or if you want to go into the intelligence community. In general life, if you want to just be a more as you said, more informed citizen or critical thinker mm. is very important. And that's also why I love talking to people like yourself and, and other experts, because I feel it's, I'm learning and, and I hope people listening are learning too from, from our conversations and from your, from your insights, because yeah, that's not just beneficial, but I think it's entertaining too. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I can like <laughs> add more to that, but I don't know what your opinion is on like on training and improving skill set. Yeah. I think, well, I think you're, I think you're right to point to the sort of, it's not only useful if you're interested in getting into the intelligence community, right? But there's, mm -hmm. there's use you can get out of sort of a casual observer. There's use you can get out of, out of that kind of training, especially God, like for, for people who do like open source Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, a lot of those, a lot of those folks. And, and I mean, they're, they're dedicated and a lot of them produce really good stuff, but it's also, there's sort of a challenge there yeah. because there's, you know, a lack of structure where, you know, for every, for every really awesome, you know, for every Oryx, right. There's like, there's like mm -hmm. 800, you know, there's 800 accounts that will, they'll put Intel in their bio and they'll just be retweeting things sort of on, uh, uncritically and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So helpful for those folks. And then obviously if you're. If you're getting, if you're interested in going either into the intelligence community or like in, or like commercial intelligence stuff, right? I think there's probably, you know, tens of thousands of intelligence analysts that work for like Facebook and Amazon and all these like, and or banks, right? All these companies around the world, anything that anyone that runs at GSOC, right? And so obviously it obviously helps to have like that, those kinds of foundational skills going in there because, you know, especially in the commercial sector, they don't always, they don't always train you first, you know, no they, call it intelligence. you know, they, they just, yeah, or they don't call it intelligence. They call it, you know, they they even if the work is is very close to intelligence, or they'll call you mm -hmm. an intelligence analyst when really you're like a data analyst. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes the roles can be. But if analysis is the kind of work you're trying to do, regardless, it's good to have that that sort of foundational base. Um, and even if like, even if you end up going into like DoD, like I did, where they have they have training programs within that called like. Well, they have training programs within that for analysts. It, it's good to have that foundational stuff because then you're sort of, you're reinforcing good habits um, in that case as well. And then, and then you're learning sort of the more, you're learning how those like fundamental concepts apply to the organization, which I think is often the key mm -hmm. thing people miss, right? Like they'll learn an SAT and then they never use it because they don't, they don't think about how that might apply to them or, you know, their organization's output. Guys, thank you so much. This is the last podcast as our normal podcast for the year. There are some bonus episodes coming in the weeks to come. However, for the normal weekly podcast, this is the last podcast. We're gonna come back in season one in January. Please keep an eye out on all our social media and the website where we will announce the beginning of season two. And we hope to see you guys soon. And it was a wonderful ride and we hope it was as enjoyable for you guys as it was for us. Thank you.